It has been such an adventure coming from Little Island that nobody ever hears about. Crossing all the oceans, all the skies, shaking hands with the queens and the kings. 104-year-old Jesse Kolachauka's life story is replete with great lessons in love, survival, humanity, and our nation's history. I came to the Philippines chasing a rainbow. I was 18 when I came here. And more or less, I have lived a life that was sort of a dream. Those three words drove Jesse to live every moment to the fullest. daughter, journalist Sunshine Lechauco de Leon, was compelled to tell her Nana's life story. Sunshine spent almost two decades sifting through a century's worth of memories. She initially planned on publishing a biography of her grandmother, but this evolved into Sunshine's first documentary film project. The film was launched last July 2 at the world premieres film festival Philippines. It won the special jury prize. We visit the centuries-old Lichalco Heritage House in Santa Ana to meet the remarkable Lichalco women. Sunshine takes us through the journey of making her first film, finding strength and inspiration in Nana, and discovering the true meaning of home. Sunshine, welcome to Profiles. Thank you. It's a pleasure and to be here. Congratulations on your first independent film, an award-winning film at that. So it's been, well, it was seven years in the making, but actually the idea came way before that. Tell us about how the idea came about. I, the idea came about because I would watch people come into Nana's life or come into our life. I saw how people reacted to her and her stories and how she would just captivate them with her wisdom, her stories, her anecdotes. So I started following her around with a tape recorder and pen and paper, and I started taking a lot of notes. Actually, having no idea what I was going to do, I just started recording. So I have literally, like, <laughs> and a room full of Nana files. I mean, from the time it started in 1998. And with until all now. those stories. I thought it was going to be a book. Then someone, a documentary filmmaker I know here, happened to meet her. And he said, you know, a book is great, but the fact that she can talk and tell her stories at whatever, 98, how old she was at that point, you know, you should really consider making a film. Yeah. Because it's so much more captivating. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. That's a good idea. I had no idea at the time what that meant. <laughs> Zero, or how to do it, or how complicated it would be. I just thought I'm going to make a film. Ah, and it's a beautiful film. I think really everyone should see thank it. You, it's so thank inspiring. you. Thank you. This is my eldest son. Uh, he's a businessman and a, and a, and uh, what what else do you do? <laughs> <laughs> At first, I thought Sunshine was a little bit out of her mind trying to make a film since she'd never done one, but she had a passion for it, you know. She considers my, my mother as, as her anchor. I think the film is a huge labor of love, showing how much she admires and adores her grandmother. I think people can learn a lot about my mother through the history that she lived through, through the love she has for humanity, through how she helped people during the war, and how she gives personal attention to every human being she comes across. She's a very helpful person with no malice, uh, not at all materialistic, and loves the country so much. Nana was 18 years old when she met my grandfather in Washington, D.C. I went to a dinner. I was given by a friend, a mutual friend. Uh, I was there and uh, Marcel was invited. And so that's where we met at the dinner party. My grandfather was the first Filipino to go to Harvard undergrad and law school. And he was a very good speaker. He was asked to be part of the Osrox mission, which was the last in a series of independence missions where the Philippines was lobbying for, for independence from the American government. I, I find that a lot of people don't know much about Philippine history at all, yeah. <laughs> both in the Philippines and outside right. the Philippines. So I thought that Nana's memories of history brought it to life. 
and, and captured people. And so she became the perfect tool through which to get people interested in history. And I think that most of the history has been focused on martial law, EDSA, is the more modern side. So I thought there was a gap. So one goal of the film was to do that, provide people the, the door you know, to, to open and, and to pique their interest to want to learn more. Secondly, I wanted to capture her spirit, the way she lives, the way she looks at life, the way she interacts with people. There's so much that she knows that we need to remember and not lose as we progress and become more, our lives become more influenced by technology and, and things being quicker and more efficient yeah. and faster. There's certain lessons. She has a way of taking complicated things and making them very simple. And at some point I needed a, a name in my computer for all these notes. So I started to call them Nanaisms. And those are sort of pearls of nuggets of wisdom on life, on love, on marriage, on raising children, on how to deal with time, on compassion. Everything. Everything. When we made the film, I said, well, the Nanaisms have to go in the film. Love is one thing, passion is another. Compatibility is another. And love and passion are not the same thing. And passion very often brings desire, and desire sometimes uh, brings uh, calamities. Well, did you find it difficult, maybe because you're so close to it? It is your family, after all. As a journalist, you try to keep an objective view, but at the same time, you're so involved. Was there that kind of tension, maybe? So in terms of was it difficult because I'm so close to the story? Yes. Uh, when, it came to, when it came to my co-producer saying, Sunshine, we have to cut this or we have to cut that, or you have to choose two stories out of the ten that you want to put in. A bit attached. That, that is hard. I think in the end, it might have also helped it. Just thinking about it now, because I knew her so well, and I knew the story so well, I've been listening to her for 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, the editor that, that did it is in New York, and he had never been to the Philippines or met Nana. And it was good because he had that distance. My life is like a coconut. I have been on a similar journey. The coconuts were not yeah. in one of the original cuts of the story. Okay. And, but I love the coconuts. I love, yeah, that was really, she I was like, I was, you know, lobbying for the coconuts for the longest time with my editor and co-producer. They were like, Sunshine, where are we going to put it? I was like, I'll find a place, I'll find a place. <laughs> and I kept looking at the film, maybe we could put it here. No, 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 maybe we could put it here. She always told me that story about the coconuts. It says to me that the coconut is the most useful, like, so many you, you, it's, it's probably the most useful tree in the world. She yeah. said, there's nothing you, no part of the coconut goes to waste. This is one of my favorite paintings, and it is actually my favorite painting in the house. Um, the story behind the painting uh, is very Nana. She was at the grocery store one day, I don't know, maybe in the 50s or 60s, um, and she said she literally bumped bottoms with someone as they were both in the aisle, you know, getting up. And it was an American woman here who was living here, and Nana, in her typical way, befriended her and invited her over for tea or for lunch. And, when this lady saw the paint, the tree outside, she asked if she could come here one afternoon and paint. So she did, and she painted this, and she took it back to her home. But I guess years later, when she left Manila, she came back here and she asked my grandmother if she wanted the painting. Well, my first memory is the tree, which, as you can see right now, Nana likes to sit here. I call this Nana's corner. Manila has just been bombed. In fact, right now it is being bombed. And without warning, Japanese bombers started bombing Fort William McKinley, Nichols Airfield, and the RCA transmitting station. At nine minutes. We couldn't recover what we lost, no. We couldn't recover that. What we had to recover was the courage to go on and try to rebuild and not blame anybody. During World War II, Jesse and Marshall Lechauco opened their home to displaced Filipinos, providing a makeshift hospital for thousands of people, which is one of the reasons it was declared a heritage house in 2010. My parents moved into the house during the war in 1945, during Battle of Manila. 
the house was abandoned, so they moved in, and that way they were able to save it. And with all the evacuees going on, apparently, I wasn't around yet then, of course, but they turned it into a, in a sense, a field hospital. A lot of people coming in the downstairs area, many people, you know, injured, etc. that they were, that my mom was tending to. My childhood was really happy. I had two older sisters and several brothers right after me, and then a girl and a boy, and we were very playful children. We loved running around the big heritage tree, uh, making rubber balls out of the raw rubber, and then we would make toldas out of the chairs upstairs. I had two brothers who wanted to be priests, so we were always pretending to take communion from them, and then when there was a flood, we'd be uh, downstairs with bakya and our little boats floating in the putik. My mother was a very hands-on mother, despite the fact that we had uh, a nurse, a governess, a yaya, because we were so many, and they tra my parents traveled a lot, but when she was home, she was always involved with us. I have the greatest admiration for my father, Marshall, and my mother, Jessie, and I am lucky to have been born into this family. One, because they believed so much in education and travel, so we got the benefit of that. Part of our education was travel. And two, because my father served the country, I got to see how important it was to love and serve your country. My mother, who was not a citizen at the time, but a foreigner in our country, also served the country. And I hope um, others will see that this is a very important thing to do, that it's not about what we can have for ourselves, but what we can give to others, and how we can love and serve our country. Why do you believe in helping children so much? So they grow up to be good people. And many of them, if you don't help them, maybe they won't even grow up. They're helpless. They're our future. My father and my mother were different, uh, but they got along, of course, very well. My father was very organized, very strict. Everything was planned. There was always an, an agenda. My mom, mom was a, more like a Forrest Gump. She flew. She flew, went with the flow, went with the wind. You, you never knew what was going to happen next. I've enjoyed uh, uh, my role as a mother. I don't know whether I've been a good mother or not, but uh, I also don't think I've been a bad mother. He's a pretty good cook. He's a very good cook. But I don't get much of his cooking big day. I'm sure he'll come cook for you next week. <laughs> every, every, every now and then I can do something. But he's a, he's it, a cook it, on it, special occasions. It, it's hot in the kitchen. He's a special occasion cook. <laughs> yes, I know I'm overweight. <laughs> Thank you for that day, she said, did you hear what she said? You think he's about eight months? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky to have him and Sunshine uh, within reach, you know, when well, I'm this age, because um, I might uh, have to take a trip one of these days, and at least there's somebody here to, to send me off. Oh, <laughs> you're not going anywhere soon. You remember our deal? Of course I'm going. Our <laughs> <laughs> deal was that she wasn't supposed to go anywhere until I got married and had my first child. Sunshine shares some of her fondest memories in this house that has stood the tests of time. Well, my first memory is the tree, which as you can see right now, Nana likes to sit here. I call this Nana's corner. Yeah. And um, she likes to sit here and she says when the wind blows and the leaves move, it's like a, the tree's doing a ballet. Nana had a lot of, uh, the families of the people that were working for her were living downstairs and their children were my playmates growing up. Um, so we used to play tag, we used to play freeze tag down there. Yeah. And then I would invite them up here and in the living room we'd play board games. I still love to walk barefoot. Nana always tells people to, encourages people to take their shoes off and walk on these wooden planks because it feels like silk. And they're all one huge piece of wood so you can imagine this how big the tree was that, that made this. Like that now. So I used to come and slide across the floor. <laughs> um, 
And then as an adult, I still spend a lot of time in this house visiting my grandmother. I mean, when I was growing up, this house was my link to the Philippines. This is where I would come and stay. The minute you're here, you're looking at history. Yeah. But because Nana's here and she's so old and she's in the present, you're sort of looking at history, the present and the future all yeah. at the same time. Everything's yeah. old and everything has a story. People love to ask me where I'm from, <laughs> All, since I was a child, because I looked different, because I sounded different. One day I turned it over to Nana when I was about 10, and I looked at her and I said, Nana, where are we from? <laughs> Very serious look on my face. She said, I like to think of our family as the United Nations melting pot. <laughs> and from then on, I was, when people would say, where are you from? I'd say, I'm a member of the United Nations <laughs> melting pot. And people used to always ask me where home was, right? Yes. So one day when I wrote my first story about Nana, I again turned it over to her and I said, Nana, where's home? <laughs> and she gave me that great quote, home is when you find a moment you don't want to leave. A land inhabited by 43 different racial groups, the Philippines became a Spanish possession following their discovery by Magellan in 1521. It was a very nice uh, place. It had beautiful homes and uh, houses. I felt at home when I first came here. Through an act of Congress, Jessie was finally granted her Philippine citizenship in 2013, making official what she had always felt since marrying Marshall in the 1930s, that the Philippines is home. A lot of people ask me what are the, what's the secret to her longevity. She does not hold on to anger at all. My life would not be worth very much if I couldn't help people. Your life is what you make it yourself. You do not wait for people to give you happiness. You make it yourself. At 104 years old, Jessie Lechauco says she's seen and done it all and has no regrets. What do you still want to do at 104? Live to be 105. <laughs> <laughs> My mother never wanted this film to be made. She never wanted it, and she kept on arguing with Sunshine, why, why do you have to interview me? Why do you need a film about me? Because actually my mom is a bit shy, and she doesn't like a lot of attention. But Sunshine persisted, and eventually it happened, and now I think my mother is happy, she's pleased. So how did Nana feel when she saw the film? What was your reaction when you saw it together? She was overwhelmed. Um, I turned the house into a movie theater. Uh, we invited, you know, maybe 50 people in theater, and, um, and I was sitting next to her during the movie. I think she was like this half the time, really just sort of fascinated, because she, I don't think she understood what I was doing. Yeah. I'm not actually sure I understood what I was doing <laughs> at the time. She, she was overwhelmed. I mean, she said to me later on, she said, thank you for giving my life a sense of purpose and respectability. And she, she never even saw her life that way. She never right? did. So being able to sit there with her and see her life on screen was the happiest moment of my life. Right? It was like, oh my God, we did it. Yeah. She's here, the film's done. Probably one of the nicest things she said. Someone said to her later in the evening, you know, you must be very proud of Sunshine. And she looked at them and she said, I'm proud of Sunshine because she's my friend. She said, anybody can have a granddaughter, but not everybody Aww. can have a friend. That is so true. That is really beautiful. That's, that's very beautiful. true. And, yeah, I, and I think yeah, yeah. that's what I treasure in this whole 10 years of doing this film and being, I've been the only grandchild here. Yeah. So we've really become friends. These were taken on Nana's 100th birthday. I got someone to, to shoot portraits of the family and, and her, and these were sort of the outtakes. But I think that they very much describe my relationship with my grandmother, which is, it's playful. We laugh together, we have fun together. We learn from each other. I mean, even at 104, she's still asking me questions that, with this childlike curiosity of things that she might not understand in, you know, the modern world today. If you were to explain to someone what curiosity is, what is it? My life for instance is curiosity. Your life is curiosity? I think so because I come from no place. Mm -hmm. uh, and here I am. I've been all over the world. I've had a nice life. And how would you describe the word adventure? 
adventure in my life has been quite an adventure. How so? How so? I've discovered a great deal of things, how kind and, and people can be. And love. What is love to you? Life would be terrible without it. <laughs> I love you. I love you too. You love me. <laughs> there are all kinds of love. You must see parallelisms between your life and her own. I mean, I think you're no, so maybe. alike. Maybe. But that's a, quite an honor that you say that. Thank you. Um, I do pick up a lot of things. I've learned a lot from her. And maybe being around her and doing this story has showed me things that I've, I don't know if inherited or been infused with. You know? It's in the genes. Um, it's in the gene. I think some of the important lessons she taught me in the last 10 years. One was she's very intuitive. She, and she's a very strong intuition. I'm always impressed by it. Nana lives without fear. And I think it's something that I realized lately that in our family growing up, we were never taught to fear anything. I didn't realize that we were never taught to fear anything, but when I started to look back at why I did these things, some of the adventures I was on young, I said, people were like, were you scared? I was like, no, it never occurred to me to be scared. Absolutely. A lot of people ask me, what are the, what's the secret to her longevity? She does not hold on to anger at all. It's just not even a part of her. And that's one thing that she's also taught us. Like, anger and grudges, it's heavy. It carries, you know, it's heavy to carry around and influences you in, in, you know, makes, it hurts, she says it hurts you more than it hurts other people yeah. to stay angry. And as she says, always doing things for other people, it's never, but don't take yourselves too seriously. I remember yeah, she said exactly. that Yeah, everything, exactly, everything in, in perspective. Try to help people and give them the opportunity to live a better life and those who are living that better life is the ones who have to lower themselves and help the other people to come up. The best way I can explain my, or Nana, there are two things that Nana said to me when I was, she repeatedly says to me, to describe our relationship. And my grandfather died when I was in my mother's stomach. So I was on my way in, he was on his way out. So we never actually met. But she always said we traded places. And that explained why I've always understood her in a, a way that other people yeah. don't. We always got each other. Yeah. And when I was in my 20s and I was trying to figure out what I was wanted to do and I was traveling a lot and I said to her one day, I said, you know, I'm free to wander around the world trying to figure this out as long as I know where my anchor is. And I said, and you're my anchor. Which was ironic, because at the time she was moving, so I said, well, actually, you're my floating anchor. Because she would also go between countries when I was growing up. And then as she got older and, and settled back here, one day she looked at me and she said, well, if I'm your anchor, then you must be my sail. That is such a nice, really, always poetic. She says these things, and you're like, you know, when someone watched the movie once, they said, did you script this? Did you have her write? Did you write these things down and say them? He said, because, you know, people get paid thousands of dollars to say this, to write right. the things that she yeah, says. Yeah. And I said, no, you said. can't direct Nana. It just comes yeah. out, you know. Yeah, well, again, beautiful source. I wish we had more time. But again, thank you for making that film and congratulations thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you for nice your talking to you. I would say the secret of happiness like that is don't think about yourself too much and think about other people. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me too.